okay, I'm just going to come out and say it. Cessationism is heretical. Let me say it again for the kids in the back in case you didn't hear me. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, distinguished guests, esteemed colleagues, let me say it loud and clear. Cessationism is heresy. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't consider cessationists brothers and sisters in Christ. I know a lot of wonderful people that are Christians who are cessationists, and they are amazing, godly people. And on the other side, I know many continuationists that are not very godly people. So we're not talking here about the fruit of individual lives. I'm talking about the doctrine itself. Heaven is going to be full of cessationists. Well, former cessationists anyway. Thank God having perfect theology is not a requirement for salvation. But I stand by my statement that cessationism itself is a doctrine of demons. It's rank heresy. And there's not a single reasonable or rational, much less biblical justification for it. And I'm going to try to prove that today on Daniel Kalenda, Off the Record. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Off the Record. I'm Daniel Kalenda, and today we're talking about the heresy of cessationism. And if you're wondering why now, well, you may or may not be aware that there's been a pretty widely advertised conference about cessationism that's been getting a lot of attention online recently. And when I first saw the advertisements for it, honestly, I thought it was a joke. I mean, it wasn't just a conference with cessationist speakers. That wouldn't be very unusual. This was actually called cessationist conference. Yes, you heard that right. This was actually an idea that made it past some individual's prefrontal cortex and escaped out into the real world. I'm trying to imagine the brainstorming meeting where this was pitched. It's like, hey guys, I've got this idea. Okay, hear me out. Let's get together, charge $300 a piece, and sit for a week talking about all of the things that God is not doing in the world. Oh, I don't know, Larry, that doesn't sound very interesting. Uh, do you at least have some really exciting branding that we could use to sell this terrible idea to an unsuspecting public? Um, how about the Divine Inaction Expo? Or maybe we could call it Miracle Free Zone, celebrating the Almighty's day off. Maybe we could call it Faith Without Frills or Miracle Con, since we think all miracles are a con. But no, the name they settle on is actually cessationism conference, not even the cessationism conference. It's like whoever named it was so tired and lacking so much iron in his blood, he didn't even have the energy to pronounce the definite article. It's like one of those movie scenes where somebody who's been shot or something is uttering their last dying words, but they can hardly talk. Cessationism conference. Is there really a market for this? Are there really people that are willing to pay $300 a ticket to go listen to people talk about what God is not doing. Just trying to think about how these sessions go. Hey, I'm Justin Peters. Today I'm going to talk about all the ways that God does not heal people. Or hi, I'm John MacArthur. Today my session is called Divine Indifference, how God is busy doing nothing. Maybe there's a session called how to be broke, busted, and disgusted all for the glory of God. Maybe that's why they're charging $300 a ticket, by the way. Maybe it's all a part of the session about poverty and how you can attain it. We'll help you get poor. Yeah, by the time you and your family buy tickets to this conference, you won't be able to afford to eat at In-N-Out Burger. It's in Southern California, so I'm contextualizing. But at $300 a head, it sure sounds like the speakers are getting paid. So just to clarify, they don't believe that God will prosper you but they do have quite a bit of faith that Ticketmaster is going to prosper them. Honestly, I don't care what they charge for tickets. It just seems kind of hypocritical coming from these guys that constantly rail on prosperity preachers when obviously they and those that can afford to attend their uppity theological conference at $300 a pop seem to be doing quite well. While most of the world lives on a dollar a day, these guys just dropped what amounts to nearly a year's salary to sit around and discuss who those deplorable charismatics and their prosperity. We are so much better than them in every way, are we not, brethren? Oh, yes, yes, we are. Not to mention remarkably austere. Why, I only indulge in beluga caviar thrice weekly. 
$300 a head at a conference where prosperity is gonna be the main target. But when I saw how much attention this conference was getting, I just couldn't resist the urge to weigh in and address the cessationism controversy myself. And honestly, it feels like such a low hanging fruit. Guys, listen, you don't need a PhD to know that cessationism is utter and complete nonsense. It's hogwash, it's malarkey, it's flapdoodle, as I heard one Southerner say. And so, you know, it reminds me of what the former cessationist theologian and pastor Jack Deere wrote. He said, if you were to lock a brand new Christian in a room with a Bible and tell him to study what the scriptures have to say about healing and miracles, he would never come out of the room a cessationist. And that's true. No one ever became a cessationist by studying the Bible. Cessationists are not born, they're made. And they're made by a rigorous process of brainwashing, indoctrination, and a deep cognitive dissonance fetish. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's just define cessationism very quickly for those that might not be aware of the debate. A cessationist is somebody that believes that essentially the gifts of the spirit, like the ones that are described in the book of 1 Corinthians 12, 7 through 11, are no longer in operation. And let me just read that passage for you for the sake of clarity. Beginning in verse 4, there are different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in everyone, it is the same God at work. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another, a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another, faith by the same Spirit. To another, gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another, miraculous powers. To another, prophecy. To another, distinguishing between spirits. To another, speaking in different kinds of tongues. And still to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So notice that in this passage, Paul gives us nine different things that the Spirit distributes. Word of wisdom, word of knowledge, faith, gifts of healings, working of miracles, tongues, interpretation of tongues, prophecy, and discerning of spirits. And remember that Paul prefaces that list by saying that there are different kinds of gifts that the Spirit gives. So the implication is that those nine things that he lists there are gifts of the Spirit. So people, not, people often refer to this as the nine gifts of the Spirit, although it should be mentioned that this is not meant to be an exhaustive list, and there are many more than nine gifts of the Spirit. Now, the Greek word for gifts here is the word charisma. This is where we get the term charismatic from. Someone sent me a video recently of a guy responding to my podcast about the NAR, and in the podcast, the guy was saying that I didn't know what a charismatic is because no one knows. It doesn't have a definition. Uh... No, that's incorrect, sir. I do know what a charismatic is, and I'll gladly explain it to you. Basically, a charismatic is someone who believes that the gifts of the Spirit are for today. That's why the word charisma, the word for gifts, is in the name, charismatic. And that's essentially all being a charismatic means. There's all kinds of different charismatics. Theologically, there's everything from Catholic charismatics to Calvinist charismatics, and I have friends in both of those camps, so I know for a fact that they exist. So the term charismatic means very little about what we believe beyond our agreement about what is obvious and frankly, what is indisputable, that the gifts, the power, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit is just as relevant today as it was when the New Testament was being written. So in that sense, the term charismatic is basically equivalent to the term continuationist, which is a term that we use to refer to the opposite viewpoint of a cessationist. Cessationists say that the gifts have ceased, cease-ationist. Continuationists say that the gifts continue, continue-ationist, okay? So now, the terms charismatic and continuationist are not completely synonymous. They're used in somewhat different ways, but that nuance is not important for our discussion today. But here is an interesting side note. The word charisma actually has a much broader swath of meaning than most people realize. It goes way beyond simply referring to the nine gifts of the Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12, and it even goes beyond gifts of the Spirit more generally. The root of charisma, charis, actually means grace or favor. And so charisma can refer to any bestowal of God's grace, and not just the stuff that's clearly supernatural either. In the New Testament, 
charisma refers not only to the spiritual gifts, but also to the gift of eternal life. In Romans eleven twenty nine, it refers to Israel's irrevocable gifts and calling. Paul uses it in 1 Corinthians 7, 7 to talk about his gift of celibacy and so on. And so even though cessationists, and frankly charismatics as well, sometimes tend to think of the gifts of the Spirit as this list of like nine really obviously supernatural and sensational gifts, that's actually a mistake. Paul's theology does not highlight a list of nine gifts that are like the supernatural part of the Christian life. That idea would be totally foreign to Paul. To Paul, everything in the Christian life is intended to be lived in the Spirit, by the power of the Spirit, through the grace of God. Christianity, to Paul, is supernatural from beginning to end, and he sees all of it. The stuff that we might consider extraordinary, like healings and miracles, as well as the stuff that we would tend to think of as ordinary, like generosity and hospitality. All of it is equally supernatural because all of it is accomplished by and through the same Spirit. That's the thing he mentions over and over again in 1 Corinthians 12. So, look at this list here. Uh, now, we, we saw that there was one list earlier in 1 Corinthians 12, but there's another list that Paul gives us later on in the same chapter, in verse 28. He says, God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, gifts of healing, helping, administering, and various kinds of tongues. So look at that. He puts apostles and prophets right next to teachers. He puts gifts of healings and miracles right next to things like helping and administrating. Then again, we have in Ephesians 4.11, Paul puts apostles and prophets right next to pastors and teachers. In Romans 12, 6 through 8, Paul gives another list of gifts of the Spirit, and the, and the list goes like this. Prophecy, then serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, and mercy. You see how they're all together. It's not supernatural things over here and natural things over here. It's all together. It's mixed up. It's combined. Paul doesn't see these distinctions. But here's what the cessationist does. They peruse Paul's lists like a menu at a fancy restaurant, and they say, hmm, okay. So from 1 Corinthians 12, 28, I'll take helping and administering, hard pass on apostles and prophets, miracles, healings, and tongues. From Ephesians 4.11, I'll take pastors and teachers, but no apostles or prophets, please. And from Romans 12, I'll take serving, teaching, encouraging, giving, and mercy, but no prophecy. I don't think that's how it works. You don't just get to toss the stuff in the Bible that contradicts your theology. This isn't a buffet at Golden Corral here. This is God's word. Maybe have a little bit of respect. And so just to be fair to cessationists, because I don't want to misrepresent their position, they don't reject all of the gifts of the Spirit. They gladly accept the ones from Paul's lists that are not obviously supernatural, like I just mentioned. But this in itself is a little bit sus, as the kids say nowadays, isn't it? I mean, can we just drop the pretense here and address the elephant in the room, please? You cessationists, listen, you guys know that you don't have any biblical justification for cessationism, don't you? At the end of the day, this isn't really about theology at all, is it? It's obvious what's going on here, guys. Let's just face it. You are embarrassed by us. You're embarrassed by people that speak in tongues and prophesy. You don't want to be associated with those crazy charismatics that fall on the ground and do strange things. You like looking dignified and intelligent and rational. That's what this is about. Just admit it. And so this is the reason that you're fine with the nice gifts of the Spirit, like helping and administration and serving and encouraging and giving and mercy and pastors and teachers. Why? Because these aren't embarrassing to you, and they don't carry any kind of burden of proof. They don't expose you to the risk of ridicule or criticism. I mean, look, guys, you say that you believe in the supernatural. You say that you believe that God is still moving supernaturally today. You just don't want to be accountable for anything that demands some kind of evidence. For example, the cessationist author Richard Gaffin says that he believes salvation is supernatural. No work of the Spirit, he says, is more radical, more impressive, more miraculous, and more thoroughly supernatural than what he does now today with people who are nothing less than dead in trespasses and sins. Beyond any human capacity, rational, reflective, intuitive, mystical, or otherwise, 
The Spirit makes them alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, I appreciate that, and I think that Gaffin is right about salvation being supernatural and miraculous. But here's my question. Why is he okay with salvation being supernatural, even the most supernatural thing of all, but not okay with lesser supernatural things like prophecy and tongues? Doesn't that seem just a little bit strange to you? The supernatural gift that he embraces happens to be the one that is also fundamentally internal, invisible to the naked eye. Anything that could be seen or tested or verified or experienced in any objective way, anything that would carry a burden of proof or subject his claims to some kind of scrutiny, all of that has been relegated to an arbitrary category of gifts that belong to another dispensation that has long since passed away. How convenient. It reminds me of the movie Drillbit Taylor. Have you seen this one? It's a, a comedy about a group of kids that are getting bullied at school, and so they go online and they hire a guy that tells them he's a bodyguard. Actually, he's homeless, and he has no skills except making excuses. The truth is, he can never protect them because he's got the killer instinct of a butterfly. He's never fought anybody in his life. But he is a big talker. That's about all he's got going for him. When it's time to put up, he's always got an excuse why he can't. Oh, I injured my leg. I can't help you today. Or, oh, I'm working undercover. I don't want to blow it. This is cessationism. Despite their abrasive, big-talking activists, from where I'm standing, it looks like nothing more than a pathetic attempt to excuse powerlessness. Oh, we're Christians. Our God rose from the dead. He's bigger and tougher than all the other gods. Oh, yeah, that's great. Can you show us? Uh, well, not today. You know, we don't want to take away from, uh, from the Bible. Yeah, that's it. We totally would, but we don't want to hurt the Bible. The gag's up, guys. I'm calling you out. Cessationism is cowardice. You say you're trying to protect the Bible, but you're really just trying to protect it from the consequences of its own claims because you're afraid that if it's tested, it won't stand up to scrutiny. Just admit it. It's unbelief. Can I tell you something? The Bible doesn't need your help to defend it, to excuse it, to rationalize it, to make it more palatable. That's not what God expects from you. He doesn't need your protection. He wants your obedience and your trust. And if you are going to be sola scriptura, if you're going to hold up the Bible as your source of authority, you simply cannot hold to cessationism. So what I'd like to do now is just look at all of the scriptures that teach cessationism and go over them. And I've actually listed them all out on this piece of paper so you can see them together. And here is my list. Here's all the scriptures that teach cessationism. Oh, wait, maybe it's on the back. Oh, yes, that is the list. Not a single solitary verse in the Bible teaches cessationism. Folks, the Bible is a continuationist book, and it assumes the ongoing operation of the gifts of the Spirit. But what about the passages that people use to make cessationist arguments? Well, there are a few of those, and I'm going to take a few minutes today just to lay them out and show you why they don't prove what the cessationists say they prove. And then in the next episode, we're going to get into something a little more substantive, namely the rational arguments for cessationism. They don't have any scriptures, but they do have some rational arguments. They're a bit more creative, but also a lot less convincing. So again, let's start here with the scriptures. And one of the most popular is 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 8 through 13. Many of you probably already know this one. Love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there's knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. When I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I shall know just as I am also known. And now abide faith, hope, love, these three, but the greatest of these is love. So sometimes cessationists will point to this passage as evidence that the revelatory gifts, specifically prophecy and tongues, have passed away. Honestly, I'm always amazed when cessationists appeal to this passage because it actually does more to undermine their argument than to prove it. Dr. Michael Brown says that uh, using 1 Corinthians 13 as support for cessationism is, quote, one of the most impossible interpretations put on a biblical text in the history of interpretation and a rev relatively recent one at that. So let's just break down the cessationist syllogism, shall we? Their logic looks like this. Number one, the perfect is the closed canon of Scripture. 
Number two, the perfect will render spiritual gifts like prophecy and tongues obsolete. Therefore, they conclude, the closed canon of Scripture has rendered the spiritual gifts obsolete. Here's how one cessationist author put it. Quote, miraculous gifts were given by the power of the Holy Spirit, 1 Corinthians 12, 8 through 11, and they were given for a limited period of time. Paul said these special abilities would last till the perfect, in parentheses, the completed New Testament came. The gift of tongues would cease, verse 8, and other gifts such as prophecy and supernatural knowledge would be replaced by the perfect, in parentheses, God's completed word, end quote. But guys, the glaring problem with this, if you haven't seen it already, is that this passage does not say or even remotely imply that the perfect is the closed canon of Scripture. In fact, such an interpretation is actually impossible. Why? Well, number one, the perfect is going to render not only prophecy and tongues obsolete, it's also going to render knowledge obsolete. Has knowledge vanished away? No, but I thought all these things were going to pass away when we got the closed canon of Scripture. The coming of the perfect means that we should know fully and completely and face-to-face. I mean, the Scripture defines what it means by that. This cannot possibly be referring to a closed canon since the closed canon itself in this very passage tells us that our knowledge in this age is partial. Now I know in part. So if our present knowledge were perfect, then we wouldn't be having this debate, would we? The very fact that we're debating this subject means that our knowledge is still incomplete which means that at this moment, even though we possess the scriptures, we still only know in part, and therefore the perfect has not yet come. And by the way, intelligent cessationists recognize this too. For example, Donald W. Burdick, who is a cessationist theologian, and he was a professor at Conservative Baptist Theological Seminary, he admits this. Listen to what he says. Quote, this verse does not say that tongues were to cease at the end of the apostolic age. In fact, it allows for the existence of tongues until that which is perfect has come, verse 10. Then I shall know even as I am known, verse 12. The general sense of the verse points not to an experience of this life or this age, but to the time when salvation is complete and we see Christ as he is, First John 3, 2. Then there will be no more place for tongues or prophecy, for knowledge will be complete. To make 1 Corinthians 13, 8 prove that God intended glossolalia to cease at the end of the apostolic age is to violate the valid rules of biblical interpretation in the interest of a previously determined position. And remember, that's a cessationist theologian saying that. So even knowledgeable cessationist theologians would never try to use 1 Corinthians 13 to argue for cessationism. In fact, I can imagine that every time a cessationist turns to this passage as a proof text, All the intelligent cessationists in the room probably bury their heads in their hands in shame because here's the real kicker. Not only does this passage fail to prove that tongues have passed away, but it actually indicates the exact opposite point. Like Burdick said, this passage allows for the existence of tongues until that which is perfect has come. Is knowledge still with us? Is the imperfect still here? Do we still see through a glass darkly? And do we still know in part? If so, then according to this passage, there is no way to separate tongues and prophecy from the present age. That's why, again, knowledgeable cessationists would rather not use 1 Corinthians 13 as a cessationist proof text at all. They'd probably just much rather avoid the passage altogether. For example, the cessationist theologian Richard Gaffin says, quote, Paul is not intending to specify the time when any particular mode will cease. What he does affirm is the termination of the believer's present fragmentary knowledge based on likewise temporary modes of revelation when the perfect comes. The time of the cessation of prophecy in tongues is an open question so far as this passage is concerned and will have to be decided on the basis of other passages and considerations. End quote. Nice try, Richard. I see what you're trying to do here. You know that this verse refutes cessationism. So you'd rather just dismiss it altogether and say, hey, let's not talk about 1 Corinthians 13. Let's just move on. Let's just leave that out of the debate. Now, I agree that in this verse, Paul is not actually intending to talk about cessationism or continuationism at all. Actually, he would have had no grid for that argument in the first place. He's talking here about the superior way of love, a virtue that unlike knowledge and spiritual gifts, 
is not only something that we need in this age, but also we'll have it throughout all eternity. So again, Gaffin is right about that. But on the other hand, if cessationists are honest, they have to admit that this passage argues implicitly for the continuation of the miraculous gifts. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, even though, like Gavin said, Paul was not intending to teach about whether or not the gifts continue or cease beyond the apostolic age, still, you can clearly see here what Paul's assumption is with reference to the gifts. Paul obviously assumes that just like knowledge, prophecy and tongues are going to continue throughout the entire life of the church until Jesus returns at the end of the age. That's why he tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8, you are not lacking in any gift, eagerly awaiting the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right, so what's another verse that cessationists use? How about Hebrews chapter 2, verses 3 and 4? It says, how shall we escape if we ignore so great a salvation? This salvation, which was first announced by the Lord, was confirmed to us by those who heard him. God also testified to it by signs, wonders, and various miracles, and by gifts of the Holy Spirit distributed according to his will. So the idea here would be that those who heard him is referring to the apostles, and God testified to their gospel by signs, wonders, and various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit. But then the cessationist has to make the leap in logic that since God testified to their gospel by signs and wonders and miracles, that means there can no longer be any signs, wonders, or miracles or gifts of the Holy Spirit. But why? Why is that assumption made? The Bible doesn't say that. The cessationist assumes that if someone today were moving in the gifts and the power of the Holy Spirit, that would somehow make the gifts of the Spirit that the apostles possessed less impressive. But that just simply does not follow for several reasons. First, the scriptures themselves given by the hands of the apostles, like Paul, tell us that the gifts of the Spirit are going to continue throughout the life of the church, and Paul actually encourages the exercise of the gifts. So you can't say the gifts of the Spirit are unique to the apostles for the sole purpose of authenticating their message when the apostles themselves, in the message authenticated by miracles, are indicating that those miracles are to be sought, practiced, and not forbidden. Do you see that? So that's number one. But second, that signs, wonders, and gifts of the Spirit continue today in the, in the name of Jesus does nothing to take away from the original gospel. Actually, I would say it continues to confirm it, right? I mean, if miracles happened in the name of Jesus in Scripture and miracles still happen in the name of Jesus today, 2,000 years later, that actually seems to make the miracles of the Bible more believable, not less. Finally, and most importantly, the passage just simply does not say or imply anything about the gifts ceasing. That is complete cessationist assumption, and there's absolutely no reason to believe it. Let's look at another one, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 20. This is another cessationist proof text that says that the church was built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, past tense. And so cessationists say that if the role of the apostles and prophets in the early church was foundational, that would imply that those roles were also temporary, right? Because foundations only need to be laid one time. And so then if apostles and prophets are temporary, then also miracles and prophetic gifts are temporary because those gifts were intended to authenticate the apostles and prophets. Now, I'll talk a lot more about this passage in the next episode because it's at the heart of one of the main philosophical arguments that cessationists use. But for our purposes here today, I'm just looking at this text at face value as a proof text for cessationism. And it does nothing to prove cessationism in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't say that miracles and signs and wonders were uniquely and exclusively for the apostles and prophets. In fact, we actually see quite the opposite situation in Scripture. In the book of Acts, for example, Stephen, who was essentially a waiter in the early church, not an apostle, not a prophet, and yet he was doing great miracles and signs among the people. When Paul talks to the Corinthians, he doesn't say, hey, you guys better stop all that prophesying. That's only for apostles and prophets. Not at all. In fact, he encourages them that they can all prophesy. He encourages them to seek to prophesy, and he commands them not to forbid speaking in tongues. So again, Ephesians 2.20 is simply not a cessationist passage. What about Jude chapter 1, verse 3? Some cessationists say that 
Jude's statement that we ought to contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints means that there is no need for ongoing revelation or additional gifts beyond what was once delivered to the apostles. Now listen, let me make this perfectly clear. Neither I nor any other charismatic or continuationist that I know of has any desire to add anything to the canon of Scripture. We are all in agreement on that point, that the Bible is a closed document. It is authoritative and inspired, and it ought to be honored and obeyed. And that is precisely why we believe in the ongoing relevancy of the gifts, because of the Scriptures. Now, as noble as the desire to protect the closed canon of Scripture is, if that motive causes you to disobey it, then you need to repent. Again, God doesn't need your protection. He wants your obedience. Some cessationists point to 2 Corinthians 12, 12, where Paul says that one of the signs of an apostle is miracles. And they use that to argue that since miraculous signs were so closely tied to the apostolic ministry, they must have necessarily passed away. Otherwise, anybody today could claim to be an apostle and claim apostolic authority. Now, this is another passage that we'll look at in more depth in the next episode. But again, even if miracles are used to authenticate the apostles, that doesn't mean that only apostles experience miracles, as we've already talked about. Think of it like this. What if I said that one of the signs of a master chef is skill in handling a knife? That would be true. But does that mean that only master chefs can be skilled with a knife? Of course not. Butchers and surgeons, and carpenters and leather workers, lots of people, lots of professions are good with knives. So being good with a knife is a necessary condition to be master chef, but that doesn't make it exclusive to chefs. Does that make sense? And honestly, there's really no other proof text for cessationism that makes a better point than the ones that I've already addressed. Guys, this is the best they've got. What I already explained to you, that was it. That's the best they've got in all of the Bible. So no good cessationist proof texts. What about continuationists? Do they have any good scriptures to support their position? Uh, yeah, tons. More than I have time to mention, but let me just give you a small sampling. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 through 5. In this passage, Paul says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts, especially that you may prophesy. So listen, Paul is not talking here to apostles or prophets or writers of scripture. He's talking to ordinary Christians in Corinth a couple of decades after Jesus rose from the dead. And not only is he not warning them not to prophesy or letting them know, hey guys, don't get too attached to these gifts. They're gonna stop working soon. No, the contrary, he is encouraging them in the operation of the gifts, especially prophecy, which if you remember, is one of the main targets of cessationist heresy. Here's another one, Joel chapter 2, verse 28 and 29, which is, by the way, the passage that was quoted in Acts 2 by Peter on the day of Pentecost. And here we see both Old and New Testaments tell us that in the last days, God will pour out his spirit on all flesh. And the result of this will be what? People prophesying, having dreams, receiving visions, and all kinds of spiritual manifestations taking place. Now, if cessationism were true, then the prophecy should have gone like this. In the last days, says God, I will stop pouring out my spirit on all people. No one will prophesy anymore. Instead, you will have the infallible, inerrant word of God. That shall be your solitary source of inspiration and guidance. But instead, the scripture, the infallible, inerrant word of God, by the way, tells us that one of the characteristics of the last days is going to be not cessationism, but the opposite, a proliferation of prophetic inspiration and supernatural experiences. Unless the argument is that when Joel and Peter and Luke who wrote Acts and all the apostles that stood up with Peter on the day of Pentecost and backed him, when they said that this was for the last days, they were technically wrong about that because those things, you know, the Holy Spirit being poured out on all flesh, sons and daughters prophesying, you know, all the stuff that happened on the day of Pentecost, that was for the next to the last days. The real last days are going to be cessationist. Guys, come on. It's so silly. It's laughable. How about 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 11? This is the passage that I started with today where the Apostle Paul lists 
those spiritual gifts, words, wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, distinguishing between spirits, speaking in tongues, interpretation of tongues. But here's what I want to point out. When Paul lists all of these gifts, he doesn't speak about them as some kind of authentication for apostles. He doesn't say that these have been given for those who are the writers of Scripture to prove that they are divinely inspired or something. Instead, he's talking to ordinary Christians in Corinth, and he's showing them how these spiritual gifts are for the common good and for the edification of the church. He tells us what the purpose of the gifts is for. Now listen, if the Bible taught us that the gifts of the Spirit were only given for the apostles and for the purpose of authenticating their message, and that's it, then I would agree that we could just safely assume that the gifts are no longer necessary since no one is adding to Scripture anymore. But that's not what Paul says about the gifts here. He says they are given for the edification of the body. So if the gifts are given for the purpose of edifying the body, why wouldn't that be relevant anymore? If the gifts were given in the early church for the common good, why wouldn't they still be desirable for the common good today? And again, notice that every one of these passages that deals with the gifts of the Spirit always treats them as something that is ongoing and relevant. There's not a single passage that talks about them as something unnecessary or passing away or something that will soon be replaced by the closed canon of Scripture. Mark 16, 17, and 18. Here Jesus speaks about the signs that will accompany those that believe in him, including the ability to cast out demons, speak in new tongues, lay hands on the sick for healing, and so on. And again, these signs are not promised to those who write Scripture. They are promised to those who believe. 1 Thessalonians 5, 19 through 21 Paul says, do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast to that which is good. So think about this. We don't have a single scripture in all of the Bible that says prophecy should be treated with suspicion and contempt. And yet we do have scriptures like this that say, do not despise prophecies. That's not a suggestion, by the way. That is a command. What about 1 Corinthians 1439, where Paul explicitly says, do not forbid speaking in tongues. Can I tell you what John MacArthur's cessationism conference is? It's an entire conference dedicated to the disobedience of these express commands. It's a whole conference devoted to despising prophecies and forbidding tongues. Are you beginning to see why I call cessationism heresy? Guys, there's no way to get around this. Cessationists disregard and disobey God's word. Okay, so I hope that you can see by now that cessationists don't have a leg to stand on biblically. Not a single line of scripture from Genesis to Revelation says anything about the gift ceasing before Christ returns. Guys, they have literally nothing. On the other side, the Bible is teeming with evidence to the contrary, not only in what it implies and assumes, but in what it explicitly says, as you've seen with these last few examples. So how in the world can cessationists make a case for their ideas, much less have an entire conference dedicated to them? I mean, think about this. These cessationists held an entire conference to a th dedicated to a theme that doesn't have a single verse in the Bible supporting it. Isn't that just wild? Well, actually, maybe that's what you'd expect when somebody's trying to make a very difficult case. I mean, look, continuationists would probably have a very difficult time doing an entire conference on continuationism. It's just not necessary. We'd like just read a handful of scriptures and say, yep, the Bible says it. Doesn't get much more clear than that. The gifts are for today. Well, uh, what's for breakfast, guys? Should we knock this thing off early? There's really not that much to talk about from a continuationist standpoint. The Bible itself is clearly and undeniably continuationist, and it assumes that the gifts of the Spirit are ongoing. And so the burden of proof is on the cessationist. And so in the next episode, we're going to look at the arguments cessationists give to make their case, and it's going to be loads of fun. You're not going to want to miss this. I promise that before this series is over, you're going to learn some new and really interesting stuff about cessationism, where it comes from, and why it is literally heretical. And if you think that's strong language, then just hang in there with me and see if you still feel that way by the end. And so make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel so you don't miss a single one of these upcoming episodes on Daniel Kalenda, Off the Record.
Now, don't forget, if you have any questions that you'd like me to address on this program, or if you just want to get in touch with us, you can send those questions to questions at askdk.com. The DK stands for Daniel Kalenda, just in case you didn't make that connection. Again, that's questions at askdk.com. Also, don't forget to subscribe to this podcast. If you're watching on social media, be sure to like the page or subscribe to the channel. I've got so much amazing content on deck for you coming through the rest of the year. You don't want to miss a single episode of Daniel Kalenda Off the Record.